All right. Uh, so we're going to be um, we're going to be covering a good bit uh, a good bit in the next uh, in the next hour. And this is um, we can talk about three principles of effective messaging. This is going to be very very hands on. Uh, uh, it's titled "From the Brain to the Ballot Box" because it is in fact derived from uh, from uh, about a century of of of, um, of psychology and uh, and neuroscience, as well as the last. 15 years I've been uh, testing uh, now hundreds of thousands of messages with hundreds of thousands of people and it's based on that. So uh, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna uh, get straight into it. Uh, we're gonna start, we're gonna look at three principles. One being principle one, know what networks you're activating and I'll describe what I mean by that in a second. Two, uh, speak to voters' emotional concerns and values. And three, tell coherent memorable stories. And I should add a fourth, which is to always have a glass of wine with you. All right. So, um, starting with uh, with with the first principle, know what networks you're activating. The the um, uh, the way our brains work is essentially they're just they're just complex um, sets of of, of of networks of of uh, interconnected thoughts and feelings and images and ideas and memories. The reason this is, this is, um, important to politics and to communication, as you might imagine, is if you've got a bunch of different networks that you could be activating with what you're saying, you really need to know which ones that you're activating. So I'll give you an example of what one of those, uh, what one of those networks looks like. This is from, uh, from research with 1600 voters, uh, uh, from last year around this time on how to talk about uh, how to talk about health care reform. And what you can see is that um, if you if this is you know this isn't the way the brain looks, obviously this is a metaphorical presentation of it, but um, but based on what we learned from voters, uh, the red is the things that they're concerned about in a negative way. They're concerned about uh, uh, about uh, it, about it causing deficits and, and exp being expensive in a big government program. Uh, the right has, of course, gotten them concerned about socialized medicine, long lines, poor care, and the fact that they like their current doctor and they don't want to lose their current doctor. But there are a lot of positives that actually outweigh those. Afford they want affordable care. They like Medicare. My parents and grandparents like Medicare. Uh, a really important value to voters on health care is actually choice. And I'll come back to that in a second because it's important in the way we talk about health care reform with voters. Uh, they, they like the idea of not having to worry anymore about not having health care. They believe everyone should have health care uh, and they, they want high quality care. So the what, what comes out of that is if you think about what you're trying to do, you're trying to uh, to deactivate as much as you can or inoculate as much as you can against those red uh, those uh, uh, red parts of the network or nodes of the network at the same time as to hyperactivate uh, um, and to keep in people's minds uh, the green ones and to situate whatever program that you're talking about or whatever plan you're talking about in this context. So, for example, we know that voters want choice. We know they don't want socialized medicine. All right? So what does that do? They, we know that they really like Medicare. One of the things that that tells us is that you that you're uh, uh, something that pe voters are most likely to like. And in fact, this turned out to be the case by large margins was was a um, uh a fix of uh, the Affordable Care Act, where we actually, where th they don't particularly like it being called the Affordable Care Act again. We actually would do well to say we're, we're doing we're doing something uh, we're doing something new now, and we're going to call it the um, the American Health Safety Act uh, to go along with, with with the other things that President Biden has done, for example, uh, and and uh, uh, or the American Health Security Act. And what it's going to do is it really is going to fix the problems that the uh, that we that we had with uh, with the um, Affordable Care Act, but what it's going to do is to have things in it like saying, "All right, not only are we going to, um, uh, if we can get past uh, Kirsten Cinema's half a million dollar contributions from the uh, from Big Pharma, uh, it, it's, we're going to be able to uh, to negotiate uh, uh, Medicare is going to be able to negotiate prices on on drugs, but uh, we could say to people, "All right, you like your current insurance." That's fine. If you're getting good insurance through your through your um, uh, through, through your employer, that's great. Uh, and if, but if you'd prefer to buy into Medicare instead of calling it a public option, we already have a public option. It's a great one. We call it Medicare. If you can't afford that. Everyone uh, is going to have access to uh, to Medicaid. 
You talk about it that way, there is nothing the other side can say that can beat it. Because if you take a look at all of these nodes on this network, it's actually it's actually addressing them all. So why, why do the networks matter? Uh, not only can they give you a, a really good guideline about or, or guide set of guideposts about where it is that you want to head with your messaging, uh, but the other thing that, that you can do uh, is you really need to be thinking about the difference that a single word or phrase can make. Uh, let, let me give it a, give, start with an example, the unemployed. When you say the unemployed, you are taking real people with, with real lives and pain line faces who've, de who've been dealing with, with horrific circumstances for however long they've been unemployed, and you've turned them into a nameless, faceless abstraction. It's the exact opposite of what you want to do. You want to turn nameless, faceless abstractions, all this, unemployed, the unemployed, you want to turn them into people who've lost their jobs. And it turns out that when I say, typically say when I'm talking about networks and you're activating one versus another, in this case, I'm not speaking metaphorically. When you talk about people who've lost their jobs, you're activating circuits right up here that actually evolved to process thoughts and feelings about people, about, about our species. And, and those are directly connected to circuits involved in emotion. They make people feel things like empathy. When you say the unemployed, you're activating ab, uh, ab, uh, circuits up here that are, that are dealing with abstractions. It takes multiple levels of action for you to actually uh, get down to those circuits uh, that, are, that are dealing with emotion and empathy. If you think about it, if you feel, if you look at the feeling, the unemployed, okay, it, it's, it's, we're all activists, so we feel something about that. But if you say people who've lost their jobs, the people who've lost their jobs through no fault of their own, you can see how I can put the emotion, the affect into my voice. You can see, it up, you could probably feel the difference in feeling, and that's because of that difference in what you're activating. In general, whenever you want to activate those kind of feelings towards a group of people, use people who constructions. Get the blank constructions out of your vocabulary, unless you want to talk about the rich, for example, and then you deactivate uh, affect. I, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post in uh, in uh, July, shortly after the, the CDC director had to announce that the that those of us who actually aren't morons and who got who got vaccinated, we're going to have to stick masks on again. We're going to have to uh, uh, be worried because there are all these other people who they had been called. Um, uh, people who were vaccine hesitant. And that week I noticed a huge increase in, uh, in their being called the unvaccinated. And what I suggested in that article in that post was that what that was telling us was something really important, that this is the week that our empathy for, uh, for the unvaccinated was gone. Because it was now basically saying, you don't care what this does to all the kids who can't get, can't get vaccinated. Um, you don't care what it does to the rest of us who are getting breakthrough infections because of you. You are now a nameless, faceless group of people who we actually really don't like very much. And you need to cut it out and go get yourself a little stab of the arm and be a big boy. And you know what? Um, uh, I, we would have done great if we could have had something like, um, like uh, Billy Ray Cyrus do a brief PSA or a, a viral video called... Uh, my breaky, achy arm, where he played it and said, "Would you go get? Would you go get vaxxed already?" Um, uh, or if we had, uh, if we had a uh, had a, a, a good beefy football player say something, like, come on and say, uh, you know, uh, real men aren't afraid of shots. Uh, and just, just get these people vaccinated anyway. Um, the constructions, the underemployed, the underinsured. Get them out of your, get them out of your, uh, your vocabulary. Twenty-eight point two percent of Americans are experiencing uh, hardship right now because of the pandemic. That's bad. Consider this though, nearly a third of all Americans right now are experiencing hardship or having trouble uh, paying their bills, paying their rent, paying their mortgage. Nearly a third. You notice how I can put emotion in my voice when I say that. When you say 28.2%, People start going off in their heads about, well, how big is that? What does that really mean? Everybody knows nearly a third, and that is completely accurate. Uh, whenever I whenever I give messaging advice to anybody, I always I always say the two things you can count on on from me are one is I will never suggest you say anything untrue, 
Second is I'll never su suggest that you say anything uh, that um, uh, that goes against uh, the data that I've either collected myself or seen, or that that um, uh, of the of the options we ha have out there uh, is less effective than the other options. Medicaid recipients. When you think about recipients, what image comes to mind of what do the hands of recipients do? They do this. They're looking for a handout. You don't want to activate that network in the back of people's minds because it, we already have uh, have unconscious biases uh, against people of color that are getting activated every time you say Medicaid recipient, even though 60 percent of the people who rely on Medicaid uh, are white. But our our uh, because a disproportionate percent of, of people of color uh, uh, are um, uh, rely on Medicaid for their health. Um, uh, the uh, that's the that's what comes to people's minds, and it's activating unconscious prejudices, which are not helpful. If you instead say people who rely on Medicaid for their health, again, you're getting a people who construction, and now they're like, wait a minute, these are these are people. Relying on Medicaid for their health, that's not, a, that's not a bad thing. Medicaid expansion, why is that a bad term? It's a bad term because you are playing into the right into the right wing narrative about big government spending, big government and government spending. Instead, talk about, if you're going to talk about Medicaid extension, or better yet, extending Medicaid to working Americans who can't afford insurance. Again, look at the difference in feeling that you get between Medicaid expansion. We're going to make government bigger, and it makes it an easy, uh, um, easy target, especially in the South, uh, for those governors who say, "Oh, they just want to expand big government." You say, "I want to extend Medicaid to working Americans who can't afford insurance." You are now going to get them in the weeds. And one one of the major principles of messaging that that I I, I want to get across that. I'm sure you probably all intuitively know is we want to be at the level of values, uh, uh, basically dropping bombs from 10,000 feet. And we want them in the weeds having to say, well, wait a minute. No, that's not what I meant. Instead, what, what happens to us so much of the time is we focus so much on policy and policy details. that We're in the weeds and they're dropping bombs on us, value bombs from 10,000 feet. And we have to explain why it is. That, no, that's not what I meant. What I really meant was this. That's where we want to put the other side. Food insecurity, whoever came up with that term the first time should be fired. If you want to make people not give a shit about people who are hungry, call them food insecure. I don't know where that came from and why it came, why, why, why we had to somehow dress up hunger. But you want to get people to feel this? Everyone knows the pangs of hunger. We've all experienced that at some point, simply because even if we're even if we're 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 not uh, among the one in five Americans who right now is experiencing pangs of hunger because they don't have the money to afford uh, afford food. Uh, but we've all experienced it. You say, say that pangs of hunger, uh, that that one in five children right now is experiencing the pangs of hunger. That gets you feeling something. Dreamers, DACA, why are why are those terms that I would recommend you, you never use? Uh, because they're acronyms and you should never take your acronyms out in public, uh, especially acronyms that even those of us who are, who are activists, uh, many of us don't know don't know what those things are. I have to I have to stop and think. Having done work on immigration for 10, 12 years, I have to stop and think about what wait, wait, what what does DACA mean? The average person looks at dreamers with a little ERS and they're thinking, why is there a little ERS? Uh, why is why is that why is there capital and then it switches to lowercase? You're taking their minds off of the people you want them to care about. Um, the other thing is it just it makes them think, well, what are they dreaming about? And how come my kids don't get to have the dreams they're having? Don't want to go there. Talk about kids who've never pledged allegiance to any flag but ours. Talk about kids who came here with their parents when they were when they were really young. What you're going to send them back to a country they've never seen and they not they may not even know the language. These are kids who played soccer with your kids from the time they were little. Use that kind of language, and you get a you get a different response than if you talk about dreamers and DACA. And again, I'd just say. Never take your acronyms out in public. You think about George W. Bush, um, who wanted to be the, the education president, which is really kind of funny because he was one of our least articulate presidents. But um, although um, after after Trump, he's seeming much better. But but he, um, you know, his signature uh, his signature act was 
no child left behind. You notice that if you were if you were were uh, were alive back then or politically aware back then, um, uh, some of you I know were were um, uh, were uh, toddlers at that time. But um, but the um, uh, no, what you never ever heard a Republican say. Uh, or you never heard George W. Bush say, say, and that's why I'm for NCLB. Never did it. Always said for no child left behind. And the, a huge difference between the right and the left is they know not to use acronyms. Uh, they know that if they want, want to name a, a, a bill in a way that will get people to feel something, get people to support it, start with naming it or something that will get them to feel something. No child left behind. It's building on a, a, a network that was already there which anyone who has any any loved ones in the military would know, which is um, you don't leave anybody behind on the battlefield. Uh, my 10 point plan, people don't remember 10 point plans. We'll come back to that one in a minute. Talk about your three principles. You know, the three principles that, were, that, were, that guide me on healthcare reform. One is um, that um, if you like your doctor, I'll to take you away from your doctor. Uh, two is uh, we're gonna give you more choices rather than less, including at least one plan that the insurance companies don't get to control. Three, uh, no one ever in this country uh, should ever be and ever will be, again, um, unable to, to, to take their kids to the doctor and get themselves to the doctor to be able to afford prescription drugs. That, that's three principles that encapsulates everything we ever wanted to say about healthcare reform. Global warming. I wish I could get into why I would, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one quick example on why Global warming was a, a was a poor choice of terms. I remember when I first heard about it, I was living in Boston and 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 I didn't know much about it. My first thought was, well, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe on Memorial Day, it won't be so cold in the water if it gets two degrees warmer. Or when people will say, you know, the, the oceans are rising by two centimeters. How many Americans know what a centimeter is? I mean, how, you know, it's like a centipede. It has as much meaning to us as a centipede. So when you talk about the oceans or you talk about the oceans rising like two centimeters, it doesn't have any meaning to people. You talk about, you know, by the end of the century, it could be two degrees hotter. It's like, all right, that's fine. Why is that? Why is that so terrible? Global warming. When you think about warming, what associations do we have to warming, to warmth? You think about things getting warmth is what you feel when you're with your friends and your family. Uh, so that's not the, that's not a metaphor you want to you, you want to activate. I remember um uh, being uh, being in in Florida one year when um, uh, when it was um, uh, it was getting uh, it was getting it was pretty chilly for that week for the spring break for the spring break week for kids. A bunch of us adults were sitting out by the pool shivering because uh, you know the kids are all in the pool splashing around for some reason kids don't get cold but um, but not when the swimming pools there but so uh, there was this big beefy guy guy actually who. Uh, looked like he'd probably played football for Auburn. Uh, and uh, and he's sitting there at a table near in the earshot from the table I was sitting at saying, uh, huh, well, I wonder what old Al Gore would say about this weather. And I'm thinking, he'd say you're an idiot because it's, it's not like it's linear, like it's always going to be hotter on this particular week. Uh, but you know what? Global warming had that suggestion. You just go, it's going to go like this, whereas it's and go like this, but you're going to have the same effect. Um, we got a we we got an assist, unfortunately, from Mother Nature, which is that everyone now there's extreme weather we can all see with our own eyes. Uh, whether whether it's uh, whether it's uh, wildfires that are are burning so much of our country, whether it's floods, whether it's uh, where that never used to be there before, whether it's hurricane season that's getting longer and more intense, everyone knows that everyone can see it. Talk about extreme weather that's caused by pollution. When you do that, you bring along everybody who's with us, but you bring along a bunch of people who've been hurt by these things, who can see the extreme weather, who may not have believed that, yeah, this is related to global warming or to climate change. But when you say extreme weather caused by pollution, they get it. It makes sense. And they can realize, you know, we didn't have this kind of extreme weather before we are now. Last two that I'll mention, politicians. People don't like politicians. So when you're referring to politicians on our side, call them what they are. If, well, if they are, call them leaders. If you're talking about politicians on the other side, call them politicians. People won't, people won't like them. Uh, so um, 
To wrap up this section, now moving on to principle two, speak to voters, values, and emotions. What predicts voting? This is from, uh, from uh, national election uh, survey data going for over, um, over about 40 years. Uh, the best predictors of, um, of who people will vote for, one, feeling when, when they're given a survey of, of uh, uh, they're asked a whole series of, or these are really long surveys, of a uh, couple hours of an interview, as opposed to a pollster calling up uh, for, for a few minutes. Uh, what best predicts their, their, their voting behavior? One, feelings towards the parties and their principles. We sure have seen this. And this was from, this is from going back up through the late 90s. So this is not even including our hyper-partisan partisan atmosphere of the last 20 years, and particularly the last 10. So feelings towards the parties and their principles best predicts people's, people's behavior. Then you go from there to feelings towards the candidates. Now you're accounting for most of voting behavior in a presidential election. Then you go to feelings towards the candidates' personal attributes. Things like uh, people see Biden as uh, as uh, uh, competent. They see him as uh, as empathic. Um, they see him as experienced. See, they they saw Trump as uh, as um, erratic, uh, as narcissistic. The feelings towards candidates' personal attributes, although those are pretty much summarized in their feelings towards. Uh, the, towards the candidates. Then you get towards the feelings towards the candidates, policies on the issues, and you're now accounting for maybe three, four percent of the variance in people's voting behavior because all that other stuff above has accounted for, for virtually all of it. Get, get, get down last to facts and beliefs about the candidates, policies on the issues. It's accounting for next to nothing. So what do we do? We start at the bottom and we like to tell all about our policies and we work our way up to the top. We're practicing trickle-up politics, and it, it is as effective as trickle-down uh, uh, economics. So, if the I guess if you could summarize this second principle, it is uh, the the elephant Gerald Duke, Duke Ellington principle. Uh, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. If you don't feel it, don't use it. And it's a frankly, it's a really good way to think about whether your message is a good one not you in particular, because we're all activists. So our networks are skewed left. But what you want to think about is for the average person out there listening to it, if they don't feel it, don't use it. Uh, we evolved motions for a reason. Uh, and that reason is that what that the, we, uh, like other animals, evolved them to pull us towards things that are good for us and for our families and communities we care about. And, uh, that, uh, and we have positive feelings if they pull us towards that. And we have negative feelings uh, um, that make us flee or fight uh, if they if they if they're going in the opposite direction. The 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 fall what I would call the progressives fallacies. We have this idea that reason and emotion are opposite poles. You know, you could take a line that over here is reason, rational argument, and over here is emotion. It's really easy after Trump to have that uh, to have that view because he was just all about activating people's emotions and reason didn't and still doesn't matter now for uh, almost half the country. Uh, but in fact, there are, if you think about it instead, is you've got truth, uh, truth and falsehood on one axis, and you've got emotionally compelling and uncompelling on another axis. Uh, you've got these quadrants. You've got a, a quadrant, for example, where Trump is, which is false, but emotionally compelling to a, a, a large subset of people. But you've got where we often are, which is true, but not emotionally compelling. A good, a good, uh, uh, good messaging is true and emotionally compelling. And there is absolutely not, there, there's absolutely nothing about a, about a true message that has to make it less emotionally compelling. Our job is to take truth and to package it in a way that people feel that truth and feel the values that underlie that truth, which we'll get back we'll get to in a second. So the goal isn't to dumb down our messages by doing things like saying 28.2%, it's about a third. Um, by saying things like that, we're not dumbing down our messages, we're simply making them more emotionally intelligent. We evolved similarly, uh, just as we evolved emotions for reasons, uh, for a reason, we evolved values for a reason. Uh, and, and all of what I'm talking about today is really coming from an understanding of how our minds and brains evolved uh, and, and function. Uh, there are things like we care about family. We care about protecting our children. We care about security, love of community and country, 
dignity in old age. Those, those, those values are universal. You know, the reason they're universal is because we evolved to care about uh, our survival, uh, uh, our, our protection, the protection of our children, the protection of, of, of the people um, we care about uh, on our broader communities who uh, we, help, we help protect each other. Uh, we, and we, we, uh, we evolved to care about the people who, who, who cared for us. So, you know, you can make a list of about 20 values that are the most central to uh, human evolution and to evolution of other animals for that, for that matter. And that, that list, um, you then take a look at, at good campaign ads. They are filled uh, with things from that list. And one of the things that, that I learned from testing uh, um, um, tens of thousands of messages is that um, if, you, if you have a narrative that is um, trying to talk about energy, for example, or climate change and energy. And I would always, by the way, say energy and climate change. I would never say climate change alone because there's too big a percent of our population who, uh, who don't connect with that. But if you say clean energy and climate change, you say energy and climate change, um, what you're doing is you're, you are creating a network that connects energy and climate change, clean energy and, and climate change. Um, clean energy that creates millions of jobs in climate change. You put those things together and it, it makes all the difference in the world. But, but even outside of energy uh, um, values, what, we, what, what I've learned in every area that I've worked in, whether it's healthcare, whether it's econo progressive economics, whether it's, uh, whether it's energy, whether it's abortion, if you connect up uh, a message, if a message has multiple values, you're not only going to uh, appeal to multiple different people for whom those values are most important, but you're also going to um, uh, you're going to uh, to amplify your message for people who who share most of those values with us. Uh, so, if, for example, you make a message about climate change, you begin with a statement like, you know, um, in America, we invented the light bulb, uh, we invented the automobile, or mass production of the automobile. But you can you can uh, you can slide that one. But we invented the automobile. We invented the radio. We invented the TV. We invented uh, we invented the, the computer. Um, Al Gore invented the internet. Oh no, we 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 invented the internet. We invented uh, we invented the cell phone. Are we really going to give up this next technological revolution to other countries like the Chinese and the Germans? Uh, right now, the, Germany has two thirds of it, of its uh, of its energy coming from clean energy sources. Uh, that'll never run out and that are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and are less expensive than oil. So are we really give, going to give this one away? You'll notice that that message has American exceptionalism built into it. You may not especially like that, but but Americans tend to like America uh, and and we evolved to like our own communities. That's, you know, that's, that's who we are. And, you know, America has a peculiar history of uh, of, of our version of of, uh, of loving our country should be about loving our country in part because we have this constitution that allows us to, to have it changed and have our laws changed to reflect uh, our evolving understanding and evolving values that that can expand freedom and extend freedom to more and more people, extend opportunity to more and more people. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, some messaging I hope we'll get a chance to talk about around around how to talk about race, um, gets at some of those issues about how do you talk about the flaws in America without making Americans feel like you're dissing America? Uh, because it's those that's a subtle thing and, it, and it's nuanced, but it can't be nuanced in the way, I mean, it, it needs to be nuanced in the way we think about our messaging, but it can't sound nuanced to the people we're speaking with. We've gotta be able to say, yeah, I love my country, I think it's the greatest country on earth. One of the things that I love about it is we've done some amazing things. One of the other things I love about it is the things we've done that we're not proud of in this country we can change. That's a pretty easy message to get across, but too often we're getting across a message that sounds to people. Again, it's not may not be what we intend, but it sounds to people like we're saying, I don't like this country or I don't love this country. Again, I'm not saying that's what we're saying, but I can tell you that's how it hears, how, how a lot of others hear it. And uh, um, uh, Frank Luntz, who I, I, I don't take uh, messages from, but I would certainly 
listen to the principles that, that he wrote about in a book called uh, Words That Work. He emphasizes over and over in that book, and I, uh, I, I have my students read it, emphasizes over and over, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. Uh, it's not what you think you say, it's what they hear. That, that really matters. Um, the two central questions voters ask are affect over emotional questions. One is, does this person or party understand and care about people like me? And does this person or party share my values? If you don't take anything else away from this, uh, from this training, I would take that away. Those are the two questions you should be thinking about all the time. Are, is the way that you're interacting with this person, is the way that you're talking with per this person, or the things you're sharing with this person on social media, are they giving them the sense that, that you and that the, the, um, the party or the person you, who, who you're suggesting they ought to, they ought to uh, vote for, um, understand and care about people like them and share their values. You know, if you look at those, they're not really irrational ways to vote. I don't, know about the, I don't know about the rest of you, but the first and foremost thing I want in a candidate and a party is I want, I want that candidate and that party to share my values. The only reason I can afford to have that be the first question that I ask is because I'm living above a subsistence level. If I'm living close to subsistence. The first question I'm asking is, does this person understand and care about people like me? If this person is president, if this person is senator, if this person is uh, is is on my school board, if this person is is on on the uh, city council, uh, although people don't typically know all that much about those people, uh, the the um, uh, they're mostly voting party now at that point. Uh, but does the question you're really asking first and foremost is does this person under, understand and care about people like me? I mean, there are uh, many people who make over four hundred thousand dollars a year who are nevertheless Democrats and they vote Democratic, even though that's costing them a few extra cents on the dollar in taxes. But that that adds up. But it's their values that they're most concerned about. It's that combination of values and interest. And any time you can create messaging that speaks to people's values and interests, that's when you've done, uh, done the best job in messaging. I know I'm moving really fast and I hope that's okay with, uh, uh, okay with you. If anyone uh, wants to shoot me a note that says yes or no, or I'm moving too fast or too slow, do let me know. Um, here's an example, speaking of economics, and that sounds, economic, economic messaging can be the most boring messaging out there. I mean, try talking about the Fed sometime, the average person. Uh, um, uh, so much of our language against Ronald Reagan about supply side economics totally missed the point because the average person has no idea. They don't have the feelings we have about supply side economics, about trickle down economics. We know that it's nothing but a, uh, but a, uh, but a, but a scam to give a bunch of money to, from, to redistribute wealth from uh, uh, poor and working class people to rich people and big corporations, but it doesn't mean that to the average person. Here's some examples of messages that I've tested over the last 15 years that win by a 40 point margin over the other side. By that I mean, by that I mean something like this: is that if you compare, uh, if you can, uh, if you compare uh, these messages and how they rate on a hundred point scale uh, to how the best economic messaging from the other side rates. Um, by a, by a um, these are these are winning 70 30 these are winning uh, um, 80 20 these are winning well it's usually that 10 percent who aren't sure but um, among the 90 percent who are these are winning 70 30 75 uh, 25 uh, 80 80 20 and you'll see why you can't have a vibrant economy without a vibrant middle class because someone's got to build things and someone's got to buy them Average American, that really, it's a, it's a muscular message. It speaks directly to why, why it is that we have to rebuild our middle class. Every time a CEO cuts himself a $3 million bonus, he's cutting the income of a thousand workers by $3,000. That really, really gets to you. Why? Because it's so blatantly unfair. And where, where did I get those numbers from? I got them from multiplication. I mean, if you've got if you've got uh, if you've got a thousand workers, what's a thousand? What do you have to divide three million by a thousand by? 
How much are you costing the average worker? How much could you have given them that you gave yourself? 3,000. But it's a really powerful statement because it makes it really concrete. Here's one where we're using numbers, but we're using numbers to elicit emotion. We're using uh, numbers to elicit um, a feeling of a, a, a strong value uh, statement, which is that is unfair. That is not right. That's not okay. That's not how our country should work. Americans should be working their way into the middle class, not falling out of it. Here's one that you can take to the bank. The question isn't who's going to cut your taxes. It's whose taxes they're going to cut. That's one that we should have been using over and over and over for the last 20 years and has just not been enough uh, part of part of, a le of the lexicon that we have stored away because we don't have a stored away lexicon. We don't have a stored away set of messages for every issue like the Republicans do. That's what heritage heritage develops and tests messages like that. American Enterprise Institute uh, develops test message and test messages so that when, when a Republican runs for anything, they've got messages that are just ready-made. They can take out and run with them because they've been tested, they've been developed, they've been used by other candidates. We have candidates have to build those things uh, um, uh, on their own every every time, which makes absolutely no sense. I want to see the words made in America again. Tested that message uh, many years before Donald Trump had his MAGA, MAGA stuff. But it it applies just as much to, uh, to, uh, to progressive um, policy as it does to anybody else. Because what we want to do in this country is we don't want to see, uh, those of us who are progressive, we don't want to see a global race to the bottom. Where, uh, where jobs go overseas to workers who are making $3 an hour. We want to see the, those workers overseas who are making $3 an hour, we want to see their wages come up, not American wages come down. This is one that's really interesting that over the last 15 years has been one of the highest testing economic messages I've ever tested. Uh, and, and it's really interesting because it's not the first thing that I would think would rise to the top of, right, right below, I want to see maybe the words made in America again. Most of us don't expect to be rich or famous, but we do expect a living wage and good American benefits for a hard day's work. And the reason why that's so powerful, what the part that I just keep being surprised does so well, because I've tried replacing it with other things. Most of us don't expect to be rich or famous. But that, that second part, we expect a living wage and good American benefits for a hard day's work. The average American is happy to put in a hard day's work, but they want good American wages and benefits. And that's a really good way of eliciting a sense of patriotism, the value of patriotism, the value of what America is about, but the value of what America once was more about, but sure ought to be more about. Uh, and that is good American wages and benefits for a hard day's work. And this time we want to do that for everybody and not just for, not just for some. And finally, in times like this, millionaires and billionaires ought to be giving to charity, not getting it. Again, you can't lose with a message like that. We, we um, so often make the mistake on the left of leading with issues like we want, a, we want a $15 minimum wage instead of leading with the values that make us care about that issue. Value is no one should have to work two or three jobs just to get by. Or uh, people who contribute to, the, to wealth and productivity ought to share in that. Well, if you believe in those things, if you believe in those values, Values, if you, from a, from just from a cognitive standpoint, values are superordinate to the issues that stem from those values. And the reason we care about these things is because, in fact, of those values. So if you begin by saying no one should have to work two or three jobs just to get by, that's why we need a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Because if you think about it, $15 an hour times 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year, you know how much you're making? $30,000 a year. That is barely enough to support uh, yourself, let alone a family of four. Uh, and, and that's why the least anybody should be earning is $15 an hour. Recently tested some messaging along those lines. If you put that value statement in, you get kicked up on a 100-point scale, 15 points. That's how much that, that value statement uh, makes a difference. Republicans always lead with values. And very often they never get around to policy statements uh, because they haven't thought, thought them through. They just want to get elected. But we have the advantage. That we've got truth on our side. You know, we don't have to. We don't have to have to uh, make false messages or make false promises to get people with us. Another another uh, another uh, issue that stems from that value. 
No one should have to work two or three jobs just to get by. That's why workers need a voice and a seat at the table. If you preface that statement about unions with that value, it shoots up. If you don't preface a statement about unions with that, with that value, people don't really get it as much. Or if you don't use that particular language, voice, seat at the table, those two, uh, those two metaphors really sell unions. And we should be using those all the time. The idea that we have a voice in the seat at the table. And you know, if you think about it, if you just have a bunch of a bunch of, uh, of, of people sitting around a room, mostly white guys, rich white guys sitting around a room who are around a conference table, divvying up these big profits that they made this year, it's like, hey, John, and they all have a C at the beginning of the title and an O at the end. CMO, CEO, CTO, CIO, whatever their particular C's and O's are. And they're going, John, I think you did a really great job. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Sam, you did too. Let's give you a bonus of this and you a bonus of this. Well, what happens if you got somebody representing, is sitting at that table, has got a seat at that table representing the working people in that company? They're going to say, uh, time out. I believe there's a bunch of other people who contributed to that, uh, to, to those, those profits this year. They, they deserve a big cut of those profits. Really makes, it really makes, it makes for a change. But you know, people don't picture that and we've got to make them picture that. Principle three, tell coherent, memorable stories. Why do stories matter? Because we are a storytelling species. We are wired uh, for um, narratives with a structure that makes them understandable, communicable, and memorable. And even in this era of social media, that has not changed. Those messages need to be understandable, communicable, and in this case, that means that means sharing as well as just talking about them, uh, and and memorable. Why is that? Well, if it's a hundred thousand years. Supposed to say two hundred thousand for two hundred thousand years. Uh, our species has been around, but that was two hundred thousand years before the written word. What, and what does that mean? It means that we had to find a way as humans uh, to transmit values and knowledge across generations. How do we do it? We did it through stories. Think of the of the great monotheistic religions that arose in the last five thousand years, which is the same time when literacy arose. Um, how did they? How do they tell the? Um, how do they convey the values that they believe are the most central? They all do it through stories. They all do it through parables, and there's a reason for that. And that reason is because uh, we evolved. Uh, humans were evolving long before we had literacy. Um, no one, even educated, engaged voters, wants to hear your fact collection, your best statistics, or your 10 point plan. They will not remember 10 point plan. And by the way, um, really key um, um, principle messaging uh, that's embedded in this PowerPoint slide because I'm illustrating it, because actually learning about it from testing messages changed the way that I structured even PowerPoint slides. You'll notice that I never break three. In terms of those uh, those superordinate bullet points, I'll sometimes have one, two, three subordinate ones under them, but you'll never see me break three at any level. Why is that? It's because empirically, I've learned that no matter what you're, you're you're listing, whether you're listing value statements, whether you're listing examples of horrible things that that are, are in our environment, whether you're listing examples of horrible things that that happen if you have uh, if you have fracking, like uh, the, if the, if the fourth thing is, and uh, um, people are turning on their uh, their their uh, spigots in, the, in their um, in their kitchen, and uh, and the water lights on fire, you get if that's number four, people are drifting off. How do I know that? I know that because I do a lot of online dial testing where people are listening to messages. They've got a bar in front of them on their screen with, where they're moving their cursor. Second by second, this way, if, they are, if they're finding what, what they're hearing compelling, this way, if they're not. So what I see is dials that go up and down like this, just like you see in, in um, presidential debates or, or presidential speeches. If you're watching CNN, that little red line at the bottom. The difference is that, um, that, I, that I, I, I have my programmer develop it. I've got a brilliant programmer who was able to do this so that I can take any demographic that I've measured and I can click on the, the demographics that I want to see. So I, I can see how Democrats, independents, Republicans respond. 
I can see how strong Democrats, strong Republicans, that is say the 20 uh, percent who self-identify as strong Democrats, strong Republicans, and the 60 percent in the middle who are actually uh, uh, movable on just about any issue, depending on how you message it. Uh, and so I'll often want to see that. I can see how different demographic groups, uh, different groups uh, uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, different group, uh, 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 different groups in terms of gender, um, different groups in terms of re religious beliefs. You can see all those different groups, uh, um, how much money they make, how, whether uh, uh, where they live. Uh, I, I can see on how, uh, how they're doing. And one of the things that I've learned is if I ever break three principles, three examples, whatever it is, um, the dials always go down. You can get to the fourth commandment and people are not going to remember it. And so it's just, it's beyond the, our, our um, if you think about it, if, if you have a, if you're in a relationship and your, and your uh, spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend says to you, um, partner says to you, uh, Hey, um, uh, sweetie, would you mind going to the grocery store and, uh, um, after work today and pick it up? You think, yeah, sure. Uh, what, what, what do we need? They named three things. You probably, you'll probably remember those. Uh, if they get up to four, you're probably going to get out your phone, and write them down. And uh, it's, it's just a processing limit that we seem to have. Anyway, the structure of, a, of, a, of an effective story in general, structure of a story, the kinds that we tell our kids, the structure of a story in terms of movies and books that we read, uh, uh, um, television shows or, or, um, uh, or uh, for, for the generation that doesn't have television, uh, shows on uh, Netflix or Hulu or Peacock or whatever, whatever you listen to. Um, they start out with an initial situation and once upon a time it establishes who the characters are and what the circumstances are and where you are uh, in time and place. It establishes protagonists, antagonists, and there's a clash typically between uh, the protagonist and, and the antagonist uh, or some big obstacle our protagonist has to overcome. And then there's some kind of revolution, a resolution to that. Uh, and in, in um, stories, happily ever after stories, obviously it's a positive resol resolution. In tragedies, it's not. In, in, uh, in comedies, it's actually usually positive, but humor humorous. Um, in terms of, I'm gonna say something in a, in a second about the structure of, of empirically of, story, of political stories uh, in terms of messages uh, from testing, uh, testing them now with, with, with over 100,000 voters a range of issues over about 15 years. Uh, it turns out that there's a structure derivative of this one that we'll see all the time in anything but attack ads is the structure of, of an effective message. But a really important point when you're messaging from the left, start right and move left in your messaging. And why do I say that? I say that because if you start left the way we often do, you start out with a place you want people to end up you lose everybody who's to your who's to your left right from the start, and it's really difficult to get them back. That's even true, by the way, on uh, on on what seem like fairly small things. I'll show you that in a minute. But um, so if you if you um, if you want to get into an immigration message, if you start out with um, uh, a, a message that starts with trying to to elicit empathy for immigrants for one reason or another, the only Message I've seen that uh, messaging I've seen that really got people with empathy starting out was about those kids and parents separated at the border because it was so horrific. And by the way, we should have called it what it was. It was a crime against humanity. If it had been committed by the leader of any other country, uh, we would have been we would have been talking about that at the Hague. But only because uh, because it happened in America did that not happen. But uh, the the um, and, and Democrats really have to steal themselves and they start having. We really have to start using the, the right words to describe what, what the left, what the right is doing, because the um, you know we should have been using the T word treason to describe what Trump was doing when he was discrediting the election long before uh, before he uh, he tried to um, uh, before he he lost it and then tried to uh, try to steal it back. But he was working on that long in advance. We should have talked about that as what it was. When he said, Russia, are you listening? That's called treason. That is aiding and abetting our enemies. If you take a look at the Constitution, if you take a look at the at the, uh, the U.S. Code, it's right there in black and white. What, Russia, are you listening? Pretty clear, and especially the next day when 
when more of those emails uh, just happen to pop out and larger students chat with them. So um, the structure of, that, of an effective political message, I said before that if there was one thing you remembered, it was about remembering about uh, focus on people's, uh, on, on voters' interests and values because they want to know, do they, do you share their interests and their values? Uh, the other, the other uh, slide, if you remember, if you, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation is this one. Uh, and that is what you want to do is you first want to connect using an aspirational value laden statement. Um, like, uh, it could be something like, uh, I want to see the words made in America again. And then you can get into an energy message. Um, you can go, go any direction. You can get into a jobs message. You can get into a, an education message. You can get into virtually anything from that. Um, uh, but start with something that's value laden that appeals to a broad spectrum of the population. Um, you then want to raise concerns. It's usually best not to start with the concerns unless, again, unless you're going with an attack ad or an attack message. You want to start out bringing people in and also making them feel like you as the messenger, whoever the messenger is, is someone that they can connect with, with someone they have common ground with. You know, you can start an immigration message with something like, you know, every country has the right to decide who lives within its borders. I've actually just made a statement of fact. I mean, there's no one who doesn't believe that there's any country on earth that shouldn't have the right to decide who lives within its borders. But if you say that, someone on the right listens to you and says, Oh, I'm talking to somebody sensible. Well, on the left might be thinking from the start, uh oh, this is going to be one of those MAGA types. But as soon as you start moving, moving left, they are with you. As soon as the, as soon as you start moving left, if you've started out with a statement, a general statement happens to just be true. Um, everyone believes that if you stop and actually think about it, and is it Sure, we, like everybody else, has the right to decide to live here. We progressives would open it up to more people than people on the right would. We open it up to more more people who uh, uh, who are people of color than they would. Um, we open it up to more people who are who are um, uh, living in situations where they are um, uh, where they're either in poverty or they're threatened um, with violence. But if you start there, you can then move into um, something like. You know, uh, we have the right to do that like every country does. But, you know, we ought to go back to the days when we did it the way that, you know, that our, our, uh, our ancestors did, which was to say, look, there's two or three kinds of people we're going to let in each year. One is um, every country has, uh, 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 virtually every country on, on earth has agreed that, that um, we will all take in people who are threatened with, with violence, with torture. Um, we, that's a duty of, of, of any of any decent country. That's one. Second is, we've always said we, we want to take in people who are going to be good for our economy, who have some special skill, um, uh, and who can who can start a business here and, and help it thrive and hire hire American workers. Three, we, we always want to bring in people um, who uh, who want to make a have a better life for themselves. There are times when we lower that number. There are times when we raise that number, depending on our our own economic interests and values. But those are the three kinds of people who we always let in. How about we go back to a way of having a having a, a reasonable way of, of of having those three kinds of people coming in every year? That's how most of our grandparents, great grandparents, parents, uh, ancestors ancestors came here. Pretty. That's a pretty sensible statement about immigration. It's also a statement that you can take it as far left as you want to take it. And you will get support. I've done the testing on this. You'll get support that looks like this from people, the 20% on the left, and it looks like this from the 20% on the right. Um, but you won't get any disagreements on that. You want to end with a hopeful solution for, um, and, and a return to the dominant manifold. Let me see how much else I can get through before stopping. Um, I was hoping to get to some material on race let me give a I, I'll, I'll try to wrap that up in two, in the next two minutes so um here's a, here one of the one of the mistakes that we make on the left all the time we heard it in that when the democrats were fighting back last november about why did we lose the the um all those damn battle races when we won the presidency in the presidency part because so many people 
just couldn't stand Trump anymore. Uh, Republicans, suburbanites couldn't stand Trump anymore and they weren't gonna vote for him again. Um, so, you know, obviously people, people were positive towards Biden, but, 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 um, I think, uh, those of us on the left are a lot more positive, uh, many of us than, than, uh, than, uh, than we were before when we've seen what the way, the way he's led and what his agenda has been and what he, uh, what he'll accomplish, presuming uh, we can eventually get two senators from obstructing everything, which I think we will. But, um, the, um, we often confuse how far left someone's policy is with how far left their language sounds. And, you know, the best way to advance policy that's left is, is often with, with, uh, with language that can sound centrist, but it's actually not at all. It's just speaking to the values of people in the center. Let me give you an example. This is a message that Celinda Lake and I tested a version of 15 years ago in the Deep South, and it won by 30 points over the toughest, quote unquote, pro-life message we could throw about it. This was in Georgia, right? Begins by saying something like this. You know, you can call me pro-life, pro-choice, or pro-common sense, but I just don't, I just don't like the idea of the government telling a woman or a couple when they should or shouldn't start their families based on somebody else's interpretation of scripture. Now you start out with call me pro-life, pro-choice, or pro-common sense. That's not what we're used to hearing on the left. That's not what most of us like to hear on the left. But the point is, do we want to win this thing or do we want to have a language competition where we get to say what we're most happy with? And, you know, it's like it's like if you want to convince a Spanish speaker, you might want to speak a little Spanish. You throw some English in there. It's fine. But you might want to speak some Spanish if you're a native Spanish speaker. The the um, so you start out call me pro-life, pro-choice, pro-common sense. Everyone likes common sense. If we're on the left, we're not real fond of hearing that pro-life part at the beginning. But if you then go on, I just don't believe the government should be telling women, a woman or couple when they should or shouldn't start their family. If we break that down for a second, it is much more inclusive than the way we talk about abortion now. We always talk about it as it is a women's issue. But you know, it is a women's issue. It is first and foremost a women's issue. But as a man, I have to tell you, it's also a man's issue because, um, uh, because someone who's a father, um, those decisions are not typically, uh, we, what, you know, we never, for some reason, we never talk about this. 60% of abortions are, uh, um, are women in married couples who are usually discussing it with their husbands. You know, um, it's usually a decision that's made by one person has the final decision-making power on it. It's usually a decision that comes between two people. Uh, so to, to say this is just a women's issue and not to bring in men and let them know they have some skin in the game. You know, they actually have some skin in the game if even if they're not terribly emotionally attached to this person because they could be, be paying child support for 18 years. Why don't we ever talk with men about that? Is it, You know, you really might want to think about your attitudes towards abortion because if you get somebody pregnant who you never intended to, well, you, she, she has a big problem if we don't have abortion available, but so do you, buddy. You might want to think about that. Um, but it's an issue that, that, um, that, uh, that matters. The other thing I'll, I'll, I'll have to end with about this is instead of talking about the right to choose, which is really important, if instead you make this about deciding when we should or shouldn't start our families, what's the name of the main, main organization uh, that not that that helps people figure out when to start their families, but also if they need abortions, uh, provides abortions. It's called Planned Parenthood, and that is probably the one of the absolutely best named progressive man nonprofits there is, because it gets at what do responsible people do? They plan parenthood. They don't just have haphazard parenthoods. They don't do that um, uh, because you've got to be thinking about: Can I afford this? Am I with someone who I Want to have this child with, or want to have a child alone? Those are all questions that responsible people think about. Um, sure, we all make mistakes. Um, we all screw up. That's why there's abortion. That's why there needs to be abortion. One of the reasons there needs to be abortion. So anyway, if you make this instead, though, about starting your family, what kind of people are concerned about starting a, starting a family? This is now about government interfering with 
your right to decide when you should or shouldn't have a child. Is there any bigger government intervention that you could possibly make than that? It's a really big one. And it's taking that, that, uh, that government interve intervention frame and throwing it right back at, at the right. And finally, if you finish it with, you shouldn't be telling uh, women or couple when they should or shouldn't start a family based on somebody else's interpretation of scripture. Now you're getting it religious freedom. Now this is about, wait a minute, I'm Baptist and you're telling me that some Mormon ought to tell me how, whether I should or shouldn't have an abortion or I, I, you, you get the point. Uh, and especially when you use that word scripture in the South, you are connecting in a way that is very different than if you say the Bible uh, or, or that person's values. I'm going to have to stop with a final thought. And that is this, is, you know, the right, it's a lot easier to do messaging on the right um, because uh, people on the right, uh, hang on, there's a, there's a message from, from uh, Heather that I want to take a look at. Abortion is more than a woman's issue because not everyone can get pregnant. Good, good point as well. Um, the, um, uh, how, the, the, the right has a much easier time with messaging. They can be much more lockstep. And why can they be much more lockstep? Because um, as, as John, uh, uh, John Hyde has found in, in, in his work, for example, and done lots of great work on it, uh, people on the right accept hierarchy. They like hierarchy. They value hierarchy. Uh, it's something that, uh, that um, is a positive value for them. Whereas for those of us on the left, we tend to value equality. Uh, so the... Uh, politicians on the right aren't busy staking out their own way of saying a particular thing. If, 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 um, if the Heritage Foundation hands them all, this is what you should say for this week and gives it to Mitch McConnell, gives it to Kevin McCarthy, people follow it. And you just watch on, you just watch on television, watch the talking heads from the right. They'll all use the same language. Well, it's really hard to get us to be a marching band because People on the left tend to value independent thought. So my final thought to you on this one is, how does a non-hierarchical party message? You want to think, think jazz. You want to think about when John Coltrane played My Favorite Things. He started out with the melody. And I'll let you guys leave as I, as I click on this, this piece from uh, John Coltrane playing My Favorite Things. But uh, he starts with a melody that is recognizable. Everyone knows it. Everyone hears it. You know exactly what it is. Next time he plays it, he's got some trills where he goes down, where you're expecting him to go up. And that's part of what makes the music exciting. It, it's that element of surprise. It's that you're waiting for what he's going to do next. Then he does some, some improvisation. Doesn't sound like my favorite things at all, but it's within the context of my favorite things. Then he comes back. If he's improvised too far away, he comes back to a really straight version of my favorite things, the way people are used to hearing it, or with just one or two, one or two trills. Well, what happens if we all play jazz that way? What happens if we develop messages that that can um, that can be used by candidates and organizations that vary in their values from center left to left left, that vary in the way they sound from centrist or center left to left left. Um, what if we have a set of, of, on every issue, we were to have four or five messages that we know beat the messages from the right, that collectively, when people hear them all over the country, they're hearing a, a small set of messages instead of what we have now, which is a Tower of Babel from the left. Um, but they hear a set of messages that they recognize as my favorite things. They hear it. They, they all come back to that same melody at some point, in some way. It creates in people's minds what cognitive psychologists call a prototype and what, what marketers call a brand. Uh, and that is, we could have a, we could have a, have a, a left, a Democratic Party, where people, people recognize what Democrats, what it is that we care about and why, and they can, they can join with us on that because it's, it's got a range to it. It's, uh, but, they are hearing a coherent brand because it's coming out through multiple different people playing in multiple different ways on multiple different instruments, but they're coming back to my favorite things. 
So with that, I will I will end by playing you uh, John Coltrane, uh, my, favorite, my favorite things. If you have time to, to stay on and listen, think about this the next time you're working on messaging is, uh, and think about it the next time you hear messaging that sounds like that message I just gave you on abortion, by the way, the rest of that message goes far to the left of Roe v. Wade. It goes into, uh, into um, you know, whenever it is that, that somebody discovers what, what uh, if, if you're, for example, uh, you hear those, those awful words from your doctor that no parent ever wants to hear, that's usually not at three months. Now, Roe v. Wade is protecting more the first trimester. That's how it's been interpreted. Um, but this, that actually message can actually move far left to Roe v. Wade and the rest of it when I've tested uh, does. Uh, but people hear it as a centrist message who are in the center and they think, well, that seems reasonable. And in fact, two thirds of Americans do think that, that, um, that either all abortions or some abortions are reasonable. And we just got to get them back there. We got to get back to hammering the Republicans for their rapist bill of rights, because that's what they believe in. They believe that every rapist has the right to choose the mother of his child. And why we are not saying that over and over and over about those sons of a bitch, bitch in Texas, I have absolutely no idea. But I'd say, um, uh, uh, we ought to be really aggressive about what they are saying. Because other than saying it's bounty hunter time on, on every woman or people, people who, who care about her, who, who are trying to take care of her, they don't believe that. They believe that every woman is raped. Every woman who, uh, who doesn't have the money to afford a child but gets pregnant. Uh, every couple who looks at them, who looks at their situations, we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. I don't know if it's safe to get pregnant and we don't have the money to afford a fourth child. You're saying every one of those people, you really want to say it? You really want to say, no, nah, some, somebody with their particular religious beliefs gets to choose for you? Not me. Uh, so um, here is uh, here's Coltrane. And uh, thank you all for um, for coming. I hope this is, uh, this is helpful to you. Can you, can you hear that? Recognizable, right? Okay, he's deviating pretty far left of my favorite things, right? He's Bernie now. He's Bernie's hair now. He's come right back to the center, center left. All right, I think you, I think y'all get the uh, get the idea. Again, thank you, uh, thank you for coming, and I hope this has been useful. Take care, all.